Hi, and welcome to Young at Harp. I'm Deborah Hampton Cullen, and this is Kathleen Wiley. And today we want to talk about anxiety and the inner teacher. <laughs> Doesn't this sound like a fun topic? <laughs> right. Um, and, and I just want to say that um, uh, Kathleen is a Jungian analyst, and I'm a composer and performer. So we're looking at all of these questions through two lenses. One is the lens of Jung's um, principles and teachings and how they come out in Kathleen's work. And the other is through the seven strings of passion, which are at the heart of my work, which are impulse, structure, character, roles, practice, deconstruction, and liftoff. So we'll be looking at these two concepts today, anxiety and the inner teacher, through both of those and finding out what each has to say about it. And we were talking today right before we started and uh, we were talking about anxiety and Kathleen, you said something like whenever we come to a situation, whether it's something we're nervous about in the world or whether it's coming to the to perform with our instrument or perform in any situation what anxiety we bring with go ahead and, and say what you well that very often in those situations the anxiety that we are experiencing really is 10 percent about the current situation and 90 percent about historical things that have happened that where we weren't able to consciously be with and integrate and process what happened to us. So for instance, you know, as an adult woman now and as the, the accomplished harpist, composer, entertainer you are, you have a lot of experience of knowing what to do when there are snafus on stage. Right, right. And, and you have a pool of your own competence and your own um, confidence and your own skill set and your own experiences that people really do want you to succeed by and large. Yeah, there may be the one or two nasties in the audience, but most people want to, want to see you succeed. They want to see things move forward. They've been in situations where there were snafus. So they're just going to love you through it and laugh it off and, and move with you. But if there have been experiences, particularly as children, where something went wrong and we were shamed, mm -hmm. you know, and we were made to feel like we were stupid or we were name called, or worse yet, we had um, a caring, caring adults around us who really um, ragged on us and dismissed us for trying, then those things can be in our body minds like a, a cauldron waiting to just boil over again. So here something comes along in the present moment that makes us afraid mm -hmm. and that, that cauldron just decides it's gonna start heating up. <laughs> and so then we're in the moment, unable to think in the moment with all of who we are because we're really no longer fully in the moment. Half of us or 90% of us, depending on the scenario, is caught in the past. This is so beautiful because I was looking through footage yesterday um, and I found some footage of uh, me in a concert where a string broke like really mm -hmm. dramatically in the middle of a piece. And I have a lot of anxiety about strings breaking, not because of the string breaking, but, but finding the right string because of the way strings are numbered in, in the harp world. And what I observed, and I probably, probably should share this, is that I just made it into a piece. And I told the audience mm -hmm. everything I was doing, and I asked the sound person to keep the sound up so people could really hear the amazing sounds of when you first start tuning a string. And, um, and what I didn't do in that case, and what I do in other situations, what I didn't do was leave the situation. I stayed there, and I, I really hear what you're saying yeah. about the fact of when we have anxiety, we leave, we check out, we're not here. We're not here for ourselves, and we're not here for others. And, um, and I also wanted to go back to, um, to, I actually don't have anxiety on stage. It's one of the places in life I have no anxiety. Um, and I think it's because it feels like everything is okay there. Whatever actually happens is what the audience wants to be with. And it's my job to just make everything okay, no matter what it is. And that's part of the fun of it for me. Oh, that I could do that in the rest of my life. There's something about the stage that makes it seem very safe to me. Um, so let's talk about what people 
might, I mean, I don't know what it is in my brain, I could break that down, that makes me feel like it's okay to make a piece out of the harp string breaking right. just as much as anything else. Although I know it's at the heart of improvisation. Actually, I real, okay. Right, I realize that, that it's at the heart of improvisation and that I have practiced with my teachers actually taking anything that happens and making art out of it. Yeah. So let's talk about, and I can talk about processes that we would use in art to do that. Mm -hmm. And then I would love to hear you talk about processes that we can do outside of art or in art, but you know, just as human beings, like if, if I go outside and I'm nervous because I, somebody has a cold and now they're trying to shake my hand, you know, what do I do? Um, how do I stay present with that instead of checking out? So in, one of the things that my teacher, Tony, always had us do was something that was called rounds, which was to take any object, it could be glasses, it could be the harp, it could be anything, and spend time playing with that. Mm -hmm. And we would do it around in a big circle where each person would come up and first we'd just touch it. We'd just pick it up and put it down. Everyone would pick it up and put it down. Maybe there were 10 of us. And then we would start doing things with it. You know, we'd tip it over and somebody would just tip, the, tip it over. Somebody else would come up and just put up a thing like that. Somebody else would put up a thing like that. So we're just playing with it. And then it would start to become different things. And we would play with this thing for sometimes an hour. And it would, mm -hmm. you know, it would become a, like a, you know, <laughs> we would start playing like that. Your or, ear horns. <laughs> yeah, right. And, and we would become bugs. We would, you know, it would become a flying object. You know, it would just, it would become all these things. And you would, and you would see it take quantum leaps at certain point where we had been seeing it a certain, at a certain, in a certain way. And then suddenly someone would change how big it was. You know, they'd be like, you know, looking like they take, like they'd go like this and then they'd, you know, walk on it. And suddenly you'd see that this was a huge, you know, obelisk. So we got used to transforming any moment, taking an object and transforming it. And so if I was gonna look at that from the strings of passion, I would say the impulse was to, to observe and allow our minds to change. Mm -hmm. The structure of the game was to um, play, and to literally allow the structure of the thing to change, mm -hmm. and so on and so forth, and to discover character, discover the character of the thing by playing around with it. So I could, I could go on and on in the strings, but why don't you talk about how we could play, well, and, and how this dealt with anxiety is that I think it got me to the point that anything that came in to my world on stage even if it was a broken string, was simply something to play with. Mm -hmm. And, you know, hours and days of doing this exercise brought me there. So what can we do? The same exact thing. If we go back and we look at your example of being out and shaking someone's hand, if there's a, you know, in flu season, for instance, then, and that you're afraid of shaking people's hands, then suppose you treated the shaking people's hands like the glasses. And so that the object you're going to play with, that you're going to improv with, is the shaking of someone's hand. You know, so then you might look at what are the various impulses that come up around the idea of shaking this person's hands. So what are the impulses? Oh, sorry, I'm off on. Yeah. Yes, I love this. I'm already starting to deconstruct it. Yeah. Okay, yeah. How, do I, how do I use this anxiety to actually make greater contact as an opportunity to make greater contact? You just got it. Because the right. impulse would be, I don't want to shake their hand because oh. it's flu season. Then there might be an impulse of, oh, I have to shake their hand because that's the polite thing to do. Or my gosh, if I don't make physical contact, they're going to think, um, you know, bigoted, whatever, whatever, right. you know. And I was thinking, well, what's my first impulse? My impulse is I want to make contact. I want to make human contact. That's the point of this. I want to touch someone um, and... I don't want to give them my cold or get their cold or whatever it is. Yeah. Um, so how can I actually use the fact that I, that there's an inhibition mm -hmm. to even increase the creative aspect of how I make connection and contact? 
Yes, and I'm thinking in your class, everyone had permission to do the next step, for instance, to the glasses, like they wanted to. Right. That it, there was a co-creation. That they didn't, neither, no, none of you created the final piece alone. Right. That each of you made a contribution. So your impulse is to make contact. So if someone reaches out to shake your hand, but you don't want to shake their hand because of the flu season, mm -hmm. but you want to make contact, then you begin to look at the various structures of how might that happen. You know, maybe it means you make eye contact and say, I am just so glad to see you today. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm not shaking hands right now because, you know, it's flu season. And, right. But I'm, I'm really glad you're here. And, Tell me a little more. You you make because the eye contact actually makes human contact more profoundly than the handshake often does. Yeah, I'm thinking that the handshake has become a convention of mm -hmm. connection, and when we when that convention is inhibited for some reason, it gives us an opportunity to reinvent what human connection means. And it gives us an opportunity to be authentic. Back to our right. talk a couple of weeks ago, that to be authentic, to, to make human connection, that's real connection, we have to be authentic. And if we're shaking people's hands when we're scared of doing it or we don't want to, we're not being authentic. So there may be the convention of connection or politeness or whatever, but there isn't the heartfelt connection. They're really, it, it becomes a character that is a false role versus a character that is the expression of one's larger self. You know, we can do the same thing from very different emotional states in our body and it has, it feels very different to us and it feels very different on the receiving end, the person who's receiving it. Right. And so now I'm thinking about this, the roles of leadership and followership. And, um, and I'm thinking that when we're in a situation like this and we want to change the rules or we want to change the game, mm -hmm. um, and there is a convention already in place that we are going to shift, then how do we do that? And I'm thinking, like I go to some meetings where I'm sitting around with people and, and um, I'm thinking that I would, I would need to actually say, hey, everybody, I'm, you know, it's flu season. I'm, I'm a little nervous about it. I'm, I might even be coming down with something myself. And I really want to make contact with people. So I'm nowadays, what I'm doing is I'm trying to find ways to actually touch people without using my hands or, mm -hmm. my, or my face and see if there's a way for me to actually make more human contact. And so I, I hope that you'll play that game with me. Yeah, I think in a group setting, that is definitely an option. And I also want to say, we all, we all have an instinctive urge to be more of who we are and just take our place in the world. So you don't even have to say that to the group and announce it, but you can just do it. This is one of the things that we often give up ourself and making our own choices because we go along with the group norms and you know there's a place for that and there's a lot of value in that but sometimes that's very hurtful and deadly to us you know so to be able to just have enough self that when people come up to you to shake their hand you just turn to the side and elbow them and say this is my new way of making contact or whatever uh -huh. because often uh, in a group setting where there's an opportunity for process, we can say something like that. Mm -hmm. But day in and day out, when we're going out and about in the world, we don't get the opportunity to have those conversations with people. And also sometimes people advance toward us with an invitation mm -hmm. before we have an opportunity to process that. So in those moments, it's a matter of, of being enough within the structure of one's own authenticity that one can respond authentically. And sometimes that's messy in the beginning. 
You know, sometimes, right. sometimes point. it means someone goes to shake your hand and you're like, ah! and, then, and then you realize that that really wasn't how you want to respond. You say, oh, I'm so sorry. I'm, I'm just a little anxious right now, but I, I really do want to engage with you. Right. you know? So it's, it's not always smooth or um, as with improv or with right. learning to play an instrument or going to the next level of right. playing. It's not always smooth. I mean, sometimes we do. We do things that we're gassed at. <laughs> right. Well, and I think that's, that's very appropriate to, to what happens when we start um, bringing these new ways of expressing ourselves and our authenticity to playing an instrument. Yeah. That often, and you said the word norms, often we've seen norms of how people are with whatever instrument they are. And sometimes these norms are based on their, you know, weird things that they do or their inhibitions. And often it is very awkward in that shift. As we start communicating physically, rather than through conventions or words, because that's what I saw you do. You said when someone comes towards you, you can actually yeah. speak physically. And I remember, you know, I'm, I'm known as a physical performer now. Mm -hmm. And when I view myself, I'm always thinking, yeah, I want myself to be even more physical. <laughs> but I remember the first times that I started doing that. And I remember how awkward I felt actually engaging my body in my playing. And, 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 and how I remember that, I really remember the first time I did it. Uh, I had this idea, ooh, I'm gonna be playing this song and, and there's a dance in the middle and I'm gonna dance with the harp. And I was so awkward and felt so uncomfortable. I didn't practice it. Mm -hmm. And I thought I could just go do it from the impulse. Mm -hmm. I've since realized that as we wanna change the way that we're engaging, we do need, I need to practice and I want to practice. So I'm thinking that that may be something I want to just like, even just like, you know, how do I want to really communicate to people that I want to connect with you in a different way? And we can, and, and then do that as we're playing our instruments as well, or whatever we're engaging in, we don't need to, we, we can practice it. Practice is another one of the strings. We can practice what it is like to lead with a different part of our body. We can practice what it is like to really look at someone's face, look in their eyes, and yeah. try to make as much contact as we can. And so I'm realizing that we can actually use our anxieties, and if we can find out the inhibitions that we're pulled towards, like if we're, if our inhibition is, I'm afraid to, to touch someone right mm -hmm. now. Um, and yet what our impulse, our human impulse is, and yet I want to make contact that can really help us find the next creative action. Does that sound like what you're talking about? Yeah, absolutely. It's, it's, um, you know, I want to say about the idea of practicing, you know, often, um, when in various therapies people talk about like seeing yourself doing something mm -hmm. it's like just imagining it over and over again and what you're talking about literally putting it into your body you know one of the things as you were talking that I was thinking about from my own experience with the heart because I came to the heart you know seven years ago as an adult <laughs> and um, how somewhere in the beginning process Somewhere along the way, instead of my coming to the harp with my full self, I ended up too much of coming with, oh, I'm, I'm not a harpist. I'm just now learning. I know nothing got activated. Mm. And I'm still trying to recover from that to really be able to come to my heart fully centered in who I am. Like I go through like I work, like I go through most of the rest of my life. And it's a real interesting disconnect that, uh, that um, happened for me. And I think happens for a lot of people, particularly adults when they're learning something new, but it can also happen where people have such a well-developed professional persona. Like you said, you have all this confidence on stage, and you're not at all anxious on stage. It's like there's this well-developed persona that you experience yourself as. And somehow it's like that needs to come out into the rest of your life 
and my professional work and needs to go into my heart. I mean, it's, I'm, I'm just having this interesting experience of where you find, have experienced your true self and centeredness and where I've experienced mine. Right. And for both of us, the key ultimately to any anxiety is how does that person, <laughs> that center of consciousness in us move into the rest of our life, or again, for me, into my heart plane. Wow. Yes. And, and I'm thinking about, I, I would, kept wanting to go back to the, the very first thing you said about the 10% of us mm -hmm. in, the, in the moment is, is pulling in, like it's a vacuum, pulling in that other 90% of the anxiety. Um, so there's so many questions. I mean, first I want to say, oh, at what point did you start noticing that you started feeling, you know, did you not feel that way in the beginning? At what point, you know, what happened? With, um, and so, so I want to ask, how do we start deconstructing what that other 90% is? Is there something mm. that can help us start right. deconstructing that? And is there anything that you can identify about the transition to where you started feeling, so when you started bringing in the judgment of, well, I'm not really a harpist. I can't call myself a harpist, I'm whatever. Well, I, I can tell you that one really quickly. Because I am married to and live with the professional musicians, then often our house is filled with other professional musicians who are coming together to jam and um, or we're going to their houses. So they were very inclusive of me inviting me in. And I also, there's no way I can join in at the level of someone who's played an instrument for 40 or 50 years. I, there, I mean, that's just not, now I can join in, but I think my own sense of being less than got triggered. It wasn't any of their faults or anything they said, but my own experience of being less than and not good enough, which I tracks back to having grown up as the daughter of very poor farmers without an indoor bathroom for the first nine years of my life. I'm saying that for the world now to hear. I mean, there are a lot of people who grew up without indoor bathrooms, but they're not my age. Oh, so right, yeah. I remember going to school and there were indoor bathrooms and going home and there wasn't. And to, to that sense of being less than, not the same, not good enough. So that got activated and it got activated in a way that really began um, not because I consciously let it, but it just bodily and unconsciously thwarted the flow of my energy. And you know, when any of us feel less than and we get triggered into shame, shame paralyzes us. Toxic shame paralyzes. You know, and this is developmentally Eric Erickson's psychosocial model where autonomy versus shame is the developmental stage between the ages of two and four. And autonomy, in the sense he's talking about, means having a self. It means self-mastery and self-agency. So oh, the two so, wow. So we almost take that spot that is for autonomy and we stick shame in it. Yeah, and, and it happens primitively it's not it, it just happens automatically as a defense mechanism and so when any of us get caught in shame we get paralyzed a lot of times when people's anxieties and fears get kicked in they ultimately will track back to an experience of being shamed where then one gets frozen so anxiety comes up in the present moment and one feels frozen Right, and I'm suddenly connecting the idea of shame to the idea of whatever that is, it shouldn't be here. Whatever ah, you just yeah. did, that shouldn't be mm -hmm. here. And so, okay, so that's why it gets frozen or disappeared or... You know, yeah, okay. and let's just even go back to the example of someone wanting to shake your hand mm -hmm. when it's flu season and you don't want to. Mm -hmm. And what can happen is you know, if as a child growing up, you were taught, you always shake someone's hand. You, you, that's rude. You don't do that. Then in the moment someone offers you your hand, their hand, if you're still caught in ha allegiance unconsciously, that, that, and you're going to feel shame if you say no, then you're going to shake their hand. Right. But if you can, if you have processed and can bear that shame, then you can say, you know, again, you can do your little say, I'm, I'm doing this now, or I, I really, I'm not shaking hands now because of the flu, but I want to really make contact with you, right. and you look them in the eye. But that requires autonomy. 
I, I, want, I want to ask more I, about that. I, you, I, yeah. Did you say the word allegiance? Allegiance, yes. I tell, did. Tell me what allegiance to shame? Um, what, well, allegiance to these learned patterns that if we don't do them, we feel shame. So that if I don't go along with the norm of shaking someone's hand, for instance, uh -huh. then I feel all of the shame that happened way back when, when I didn't want to shake their hand and didn't, but got told what a bad girl I was. And so oh, I didn't know that that's what you're supposed to do or whatever. Right. So, so we learn to survive. We, we give allegiance to those things and we go along with it, even what though is, it what isn't. What does allegiance mean? Uh, loyalty, honoring. Oh, almost like it's either our religion or it's our country or it's like the, the country of good manners or something like that. Yeah, but our, our deepest allegiances are to the things that we learn between birth and five years old. We have no idea often cognitively what they are, but they come up in our body. We know because of what happens in our body. We, we, we have allegiance because that's how we stayed alive. Wow. Okay, yeah. so <laughs> I'm gonna want to tra I want to <clears throat> trace all this back, and, okay. um, <clears throat> and uh, so we talked about anxiety. We talked about the inner teacher, um, and so I want to bring that in. And 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 I have a feeling that when we bring in that inner teacher, that's going to help us answer the question about how we sort of untangle this, at least mm. in, in a moment. And I can say that for me, in using the strings of passion part of the beauty of having a system any system to break down ideas is that it just allows me to take a breath and say what's the impulse here what what's what structure am i creating do mm -hmm. i want to create or not create what character am i bringing what mood am i bringing into this what am i bringing a mood of fear am i bringing a mood of i'm scared you know i'm scared of you or or a mood of we're partners so what's the character there? What are our roles? Am I in a role? Can I take on the role of leadership in any moment? Not meaning I'm going to tell you what to do, but leadership in, in, in terms of coming in with absolute faith that, that I can lead this moment and I can be together with you. And then um, the practices of practicing these things, actually consciously, like right now, I am going to consciously go out into the world and think about how am I going to engage with people? How am I going to get to engage with people more? You know, whether it's because I'm afraid of the flu season or, or just because I want to, because I want to have a new way of engaging them with them. And then right now we're deconstructing that so, so that I can put it into play. And then I will see what happens in mm -hmm. terms of liftoff when I actually connect with people. Right. And that will be the moment of um, sort of, of, of being, of being. I mean, it's all beingness, but being with someone else. So that's how I would use my principles. How will you use yours? Or how would we, we use yours? You just articulated it. We'd go, we, if the process is the same, the object is just what's different. Like the process of the improv with the glasses is the same process we just went through together with the shaking of the hand and looking at other options. So the process is the same. You, you play? <laughs> you play. <laughs> you play. It's really emotional to me. Yeah, you play. Yeah. So you can play with anything. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And, and not that we need the support of a great psychoanalyst for that, but, <laughs> but Winnicott, um, who was a pediatrician before he became a psychoanalyst, writes a lot about the importance of play mm. and that for individuation to happen, we have to play. Mm -hmm. And you and I just played together with, um, you know, looking at it from the heart perspective, but looking at it from the glasses and looking oh. at it from the shaking of the hand. Uh -huh. Yeah. And, and, when, and when we know that we're bringing in the anxieties, I mean, it sounds like what you're saying is simply knowing that is, is what we need to know. And the actions, the actions we'll take are the actions of play and connection and um, just all the actions that we just talked about. Yes, and, and I think the strings of passion are a great thing to, to um, a, a system, if we want to say that to play with the anxiety. So just like, again, 
we looked at what might be the impulses when someone goes to shake your hand. Right. That the anxiety is informing. And I think we came up with at least three. There are probably more. Right. But that you that we can use these strings as a way of relating to um what it is that really matters which it's, fun. is it's funny because as you're saying this i'm thinking yeah it's kind of like a rudimentary uh, i mean it's, it's so not as complex as what you deal with that's as right. sort of sort of seven things you can kind of tick off you know and it's also helping me understand that in any moment there are many different impulses that we are responding to yes and, and they're not always impulses of what we want to do, but they're impulses of what's touching us, what's touching us in many different areas of our life. Many, by areas of my life, our life, I mean different times yeah. of our life. Yes. And, and what often happens when we're unconscious or unaware, it would be another way of saying, if we're unconscious or unaware, then the impulse that we have an unconscious allegiance to that got, that we had to go along with when we were dependent on the people enforcing it or setting it in motion, that's the one that will kick in. And here often is where we end up in a role that's disconnected from the larger self. But when we can see, know that, be aware of it, then we can back up and say, wait a minute, what are all of the other impulses that come from within me? There's this learned one, but there are these others. And then we can begin to play with it, you know, play with what are the possible structures those impulses might take. What's the character we want to express, i.e. connection, human open-heartedness, you know? How might that be the role that we're going to fuel all the energy into? It's very helpful to remember that anxiety and fear is only energy. Right. And physiologically, the body responds the same to excitement and anticipation as it does in anxiety and fear. Uh -huh. The physiological response is the same. Right. And I'm, I'm, what I'm hearing you say is that we can choose our allegiance. Once we're conscious. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, right. Okay, great. So once we're conscious, once we break it down and see that there's a choice in yes. our allegiance, then we can choose to have allegiance to that different way of being. And then, then we can choose to use all our create all our creativity to to do the one where we have the allegiance to the connection. And the other thing I really love that I was thinking about when you said that was one of the things I'm always saying to my students in the academy and trying to understand myself is that we can have a peak musical or life experience and we can create it for ourselves and others at any level of of technical ability yes and yes. so what i'm hearing in this moment as we talk about you know if i'm inhibited because i'm i feel like i have i might be sick or somebody else might be sick and i don't want to shake their hand that is kind of like a level of technical ability. In other words, I don't, I've, I've gotten rid of the, of saying, okay, I'm gonna touch your hands, mm -hmm. or I'm gonna kiss you on the lips. But that does not mean I can't have a peak human connection experience. And that's where, and when I accept that and I understand it, that's when creativity comes in, and that's when I am really bringing myself. Yes. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. You're welcome. And I just want to say, I just so appreciate the lift off that happened as we were together this morning, having this dialogue, because it feels like there have been several lift offs. So I'm, I'm just grateful for that. You know? Yeah, I really am too. And I'm grateful for, I mean, we said we were going to talk about the inner teacher. I don't know whether we did or not, but what I did experience, well, what I experienced was that by breaking this down, mm -hmm. the inner teacher, either within me or, or between us, gave me that teaching and a way of understanding how I can engage in the world Yes, in, in a way that I want to be regardless of the circumstances around me. Yeah, yes, that's beautifully said. 
Thank you so much, Kathleen. I really love this as always. And I look forward to seeing you next week. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.